Okay, uh, welcome everybody. Um, welcome to the Investing in Peatlands event. Um, we're very happy to be launching this report today. Uh, before I get started, just um, a quick one um, in terms of housekeeping. Um, so we're in webinar mode. Your microphones are muted. Um, we will be doing questions through the Q&A box um, and comments in the chat feed. Um, and we'll be doing a Q&A at the, at the end of the session where we will be looking at questions. Um, we're recording the webinar, um, so the report and the recording will be available afterwards. Um, and then please um, add your name and your organization um, so we can see who you are um, as we go through the session. So um, again, a warm welcome. We're really delighted to be launching uh, Investing in Peatlands. Um, it's been a very much a collaborative effort, uh, I would say, with both European and global leaders in, in peatland restoration and conservation. You'll be hearing from many of the partners today, um, but I'd like to give a special thanks to Climate Catalyst and the EU Horizon Waterlands Project, which have uh, made this publication possible. So the origins of the report um, came from a group of um, initiatives that are working on peatland restoration uh, at landscape level, uh, mostly in the UK and Ireland, but are also across the rest of Europe. Um, and as you know, restoring peatlands has multiple benefits uh, for society in terms of improving biodiversity, tackling climate change, and stimulating local economies. And these initiatives, these peatland restoration initiatives, uh, are working very much to engage the private sector, both investors and, and corporations, um, in peatland restoration. So to provide returns uh, to the investors um, and the businesses, um, but also to provide wider benefits for people in nature. So the aim of the publication has very much been to, to make the case, to present to investors the high investment potential of peatlands, but also of the potential for scale uh, by looking at restoration and peatland restoration at a landscape level. Uh, so the report will showcase lots of examples um, of those landscape level initiatives, um, as well as um, monitoring and reporting frameworks that give a lot of certainty in terms of the impact uh, of, of those restoration. So in terms of our partners, uh, we have a wide range, um, international organizations, the Global Peatlands Initiative um, and the European Peatlands Initiative, and also uh, Wetlands International. Um, we've had a lot of support from the Flow Country Initiative in Scotland. Um, so you'll see a range of logos there from Nature Scott, the Highland Council, the Highlands and Islands Enterprise, North Highlands Initiative, Environmental Research Initiative and RSPB Scotland. Also from the UK, we have IUCN National Committee for the UK uh, that has contributed. Um, in Germany's Suco Foundation and the Greisfeld Meyer Center, uh, and also Bax and Company. And finally, uh, oh, sorry, and Peatlands uh, Finance Ireland uh, has also been very supportive and represents a range of stakeholders whose logos are not here, but there is a large range of government and, and NGO organizations behind that. Um, and then finally, the Horizon Group, uh, which has helped uh, pull, the, pull this report together. So I'd like to take you briefly through the agenda just before we get started. Um, so we're going to start by looking at the benefits of investing at landscape scale um, and the main recommendations of the, publication, of the report. That'll take about 10 minutes. Um, then we'll go into stories from the pilots, which should take about 20 minutes. There you'll be hearing from a lot of the partners and contributors. And then we'll have a roundtable discussion um, looking at key challenges and opportunities uh, of peatland restoration in terms of investment. So that'll be in about another 20 minutes. Um, and then finally, we're hoping to have time for a quick Q&A session of about five minutes at the end and some closing remarks. So in terms of time, and without further ado, um, I'd like to introduce Paul Chatterton. So he's the founder um, and CEO um, of the Landscape Finance Lab. Um, and he's going to talk to us about the benefits of investing at a landscape scale. Over to you, Paul. Thanks very much, Rolf. And hello, everyone. Delightful to be here with you. And, and congratulations to Rolf and to everyone who's involved in putting this together. I'm delighted to, to have a role in this launch. Um, why, why peatlands? Uh, I think everyone knows that now that the natural climate solutions make up more than 30 percent of the of the possible solutions on this planet for addressing climate change and um, everyone knows about rainforests as the as the climate solution um, and there's been a very strong process to to build a global process uh, a global instrument for protecting rainforests the the red instrument which started in bali in 2009 and was locked in 
in Warsaw in 2014. There's billions of dollars gone into that, a common approach by governments around the world. But peatlands are 20 times more effective at storing carbon than rainforests are. Um, so why haven't we been working on on peatlands since then? That's that's the paradox. Uh, we started uh, the landscape finance started uh, lab started working on peatlands only a few years ago, um, and the key question is how to get current activities up to scale. And I have to call out organisations like Wetlands International who have been there right from the beginning, holding holding this. Um, but it's groups like climate. Climate Catalyst and Waterlands and uh, the Global Peatlands initiative, initiative who are now starting to open that question of how to how to get scale and how to get a common global approach to peatlands. Um, there's five re big reasons why you want to go go to peatlands. Uh, they store massive amounts of carbon. They take up only three percent of the Earth's area but store 30% of, of the natural carbon on this planet. And, and if we can achieve peatland restoration, we reduce the world's carbon budget by 5%. Um, <clears throat> water quality is critical. 70% um, of the UK's drinking water comes from, from peatlands. Uh, and the, the water agencies are only now starting to realise that there are critical tool for dealing with uh, with flooding because they they retain water they store the water um and and help you protect from droughts as well so the strong stakeholder support uh, growing for peatlands but but still a lot needed to to build the uh, the understanding um nature natural ecosystems these this is where a lot of biodiversity uh sits in peatlands for ireland that's certainly the case but you go to the to the, to the uh, amazon the pantanal is a massive store of biodiversity along with the rainforests uh in florida in the us in the in the, the peatlands of the congo um they're critical for risk management uh fires uh, if you let peatlands dry out they become very dangerous in 2015 indonesia discovered that uh, with the the peatland fires that uh, that cost to cost fifteen billion dollars, and then of course for for employment, uh, polluter culture is now coming out uh, as a as a, as a useful tool for for employing people. So it's time for peatlands to be front and center as a nature and climate solution, and we need a global effort. I think we're moving towards that with this report. And let me hand back to Rolf. Right, thank you, Paul. Thanks very much. Um, and now I'd like to hand over to uh, Rupal Kanabara, who's going to also from the Landscape Finance Lab, um, who's our finance expert, who's going to talk about the main recommendations of the report. Thank you very much, Rolf. Um, so interest in investment in peatlands is really starting to gather momentum. But as we are all aware, investment in this asset class is at a fairly early stage in its life cycle. We found that there's a lot of similarities between investing in peatlands and other nature-based solutions, for example, mangroves, where the key output is predominantly nature credits. Catalyzing flow of capital into peatlands will require collaborative effort from a number of different stakeholders, which includes all of the participants here on the call, as well as the panelists and beyond, who represent the investor community, corporates, NGOs, and the public sector. Through this paper that we've launched today, as Rolf mentioned, we have showcased a number of different examples of early stage movement of capital into peatlands. And we hope that the number of potential investment opportunities globally for peatlands continues to grow for all different types of capital, from non-repayable philanthropic grants through to repayable institutional capital generating market rate returns. There's a number of ways in which we can actually increase investment into peatlands. However, through this publication, we've tried to simmer those down to four specific recommendations that we believe will allow capital to flow at scale to peatlands. So as you'll see on the screen, our first recommendation is that various stakeholders, especially in the investor community, support pilot landscapes. So what do we actually mean by this? In order for capital to flow at scale into peatlands, we need to develop track record for investors prove that pe peatlands are an actually an investable asset class that generate returns. There's a number of different ways in which parties can support the development of pilot landscapes. A small subset of these are available in more detail in the report, 
but these include providing technical assistance for peatland landscape design and development, investing in methodology and development, among other things. Our second re recommendation is to ensure that we're all aligned to catalyze private sector capital. Without private sector, uh, sector investment, we will not be able to restore peatlands at the scale and the speed required. It's a key part of the puzzle. As we seek to develop track record by supporting pilot landscapes, we should concurrently seek to achieve alignment between government, philanthropic, and private sector funding. This is key. Blended finance structures will enable this. Risk defeasance mechanisms and participation from risk tolerant investors in the form of first loss tranches, guarantees, and below market rate returns will allow us to develop peatlands into a bankable asset class. Our third recommendation, as you'll note on the screen, is to ensure that we're all adopting and adhering to high integrity frameworks and standards. It's quite the alphabet soup when it comes to frameworks and standards, as we're all aware, SBTI, TNFD, ISSB, S1, S2, and we're starting to slowly see convergence in the marketplace and a common understanding is being built. However, we need to ensure that as we increase investment into peatlands, we are collecting the right information that is high quality and reporting it transparently so as to collectively create change in the right way. Final recommendation through this report is that we need to share best practices, lessons learned, examples of success or failure with each other. Each and every one of us in this call today will have a different role to play in building out the peatland ecosystem. It's vital that as a community of practice, we share what we have learned with others. There's absolutely no point in reinventing the wheel. We really don't have time for that. The world's literally on fire. We need collaboration to increase bankability of peatland restoration, increase know-how, and work collectively to restore nature. With that, I will pause here and pass on to fellow contributors to the paper who provides some detail on the pilot. Thank you. Great, thanks, Rupal. Um, so now we're going to get into to the the stories about from the different landscapes. Um, for the speakers, just a quick reminder, you've got five minutes, um, and I'd ask you to quickly introduce yourself at the beginning. Um, so, uh, Graham, over to you from Scotland. Graham Neville. Hello, and thanks, Rolf. Thanks very much indeed for the uh, invitation to come and share in this uh, really important launch of the document. So, uh, come with me to the north of Scotland, to our uh, peatlands in KFS and Sutherland, um, a fantastic peatland landscape um, stretching over uh, 400,000 hectares. This story starts back in 1988, when the conflict, the land use conflict between afforestation and peatlands was really quite a significant public sector discussion at the time uh, and public debate at the time. And it was realised at that point the importance of the peatlands of KFS and Sutherland. Run forward a few years and that importance is much more globally recognised, so much so that we have been invited to and have submitted a bid for World Heritage Listing to UNESCO and we hope to hear about that in uh, June this year. And on the, on the strength of the ecosystem, the representation of the blanket bog ecosystem. So what's really important here is that we have an incredible peatland asset, much of which is in very good quality, but some of which has been degraded by different land uses over time. And on the back of the World Heritage Site uh, investment, we, uh, we really wanted to try to get more value for this, get more value for feeding something back into the outstanding universal value of the World Heritage Site, feeding more back into communities, and importantly, ensuring that the good quality peatland stays in good quality, is climate resilient into the future, can withstand climate pressures, and where it has been degraded, it is restored. And we need to see, as Rupa was just saying, we need to see that huge uptake uh, in restoration at much higher speed uh, and, and much quicker to be able to secure climate resilience. So we have a vision within the landscape supported by uh, the Landscape Finance Lab um, through a, an extensive community and stakeholder consultation to carry out this, uh, to create this vision of a new collaborative approach um, for modeling peatland restoration, blending public and private finance, facilitating a just transition to net zero economy within the north of Scotland, supporting community development and community resilience, and addressing our biodiversity and climate crises. So a little bit about our landscape. Um, as I said, uh, 400,000 hectares, um, around 40,000 people in very dispersed communities across the landscape. Um, it is 
the largest and most intact blanket bog in Europe, possibly the world, um, and has incredible um, biodiversity and some really uh, important species assemblages which are very, very restricted in their global distribution. Um, 400 million tonnes of carbon are stored in the four-country peatlands. That's more than double of all of the UK's woodlands uh, resource. Um, so the very fundamentals of the report here are, are played out in this landscape. We've got the landscape scale approach, we've got a true multi-stakeholder partnership, we've got uh, public, private, third sector investors and uh, stakeholders and community development right at the very heart of this project. So we are really keen to now start to engage with investors and, uh, and bring this to a reality with the um, first pilot um, restoration of the aggregation uh, project starting just this year, thanks to the Facility for Investment Readiness Fund in Scotland. So if you're at all interested in coming, uh, looking at the flow country a bit more, please do get in touch with me. Uh, Rolf, I shall hand back to you. Thank you. Right. Thanks very much, Graeme. Um, and so now we're moving across to Ireland um, and Guantanef um, is going to take us uh, to um, um, payment schemes that are active in, in Ireland. Guantanef, over to you. Thank you very much. I hope you can hear me. I can actually see the <clears throat> presentation, but hopefully uh, I can go through and you can see me as well. So thank you very much for inviting to this event. And obviously the Landscape Lab for, for organizing this event. That's really, really important for pillars and pillar restoration across uh, not only uh, Ireland, but across Europe and the world. Certainly here in Ireland and, and, and through Waterlands, we, we have a lot of experience in relation to how we can actually implement restoration. So one of the first things that we need to do uh, when we're thinking about this is support the local communities. And that's what we've been doing with the project Life IP Wild Anti Nature and the team here. We're looking at new strategies uh, to support local communities and build the capacity that we were speaking before. We know we need to restore a lot of pillars and we don't really have the capacity um, to to restore them at the time at the speed that we need so one of the things that we're doing here is setting the knowledge that we have and making sure we have the capacity to restore these buildings uh, uh, and, and, and improve the environment another important thing that we're doing as well and i will explain in more detail in the next slide as well is a robust assessment on environmental variables linked to payments so we're assessing the habitat quality and we link, we link the payments that we give uh, to to the local communities and the farmers in this case based on the habitat quality. And that's something new uh, uh, in the European context and something that very interestingly could change uh, the way that we see things. The other thing that obviously is very important, as I was saying, uh, the higher quality the habitat has, the higher payment level will be. So it's incentives there as well, a financial incentive to the farmers to achieve better quality. So we have many, many uh, cases where the farmers actually come to us and ask us what we can do to improve the habitat quality and therefore uh, get a higher payment level. And that I think is important uh, in order to um, get uh, the support required for the local communities, but also very importantly uh, to deliver restoration uh, and so on. So in the case of Waterlands uh, and the project that I'm working with, um, obviously um, we have uh, an area of of um, uh, 900, 700, hectares. So we focus on cool canary in uplands, as I see. And we're using that as a pilot, as where we were saying before, pilot studies are really important to better understand the model and, and promote this. And this, as I see, is under uh, our project. Uh, and what we're trying to do there is restore a, a range of habitats, mainly blanket bob, but also some race box and fence. And what we're trying to do is apply this resource-based payment uh, a SIM. So it's a new agroenvironment um, um, a sim that actually aims to uh, improve the habitat. And uh, we start as a pilot study uh, in the west of Ireland, and now it's been implemented across all the country just because the success of the results. And we're hoping as well to contribute to European Union level legislation to implement this across Europe. So it's a really, really important way to do things. And again, as I was saying before, all these payments are linked with the quality of the habitat. And the things that we're looking here is not only about vegetation, but also about ecological integrity of the sites hydrological stability, so we're looking as well on how the hydrology of the peatland works. And certainly, we're also looking at reducing the treats on peatlands. So as we know, we have problems with forestry, turf cutting, and other um, pressures on the peatlands here in Ireland. And we actually um, promote the reduction of these treats by improving the payments that um, the farmers can do. 
And what actually is a, a novel um, element on this program? I said, well, it's voluntary. So the farmers can decide to join or not on the program. But certainly what we have in, in Waterlands, in this case, on our action size, and 99% acceptance and engagement on the program, which actually indicates that the farmers are really interested in that. Why this landscape? So I think it's why it's important uh, example um, it's important in this landscape at the sample that we can give or the, or the information that we can provide to other action sites and other restoration projects is a stakeholder engagement is a key element for us uh, we have done a lot of work with the farmers uh, individually and this actually has promoted restoration even the own farmers doing their actions Again, training the farmers to do restoration as well, um, building the capacity. We have issues here with contractors because we don't have enough capacity. So we're trying to do certainly is promote the restoration and, and training with the farmers and local communities. So we give them opportunities as well to, to get some direct uh, payments. And certainly uh, all of this with uh, support on science and making sure we also do direct measurements on ecological, hydrological and climate benefits of these buildings. So again, facilitating the, the investment at some point as well. As you can see on the graphic on the on the right, the small um, diagram uh, results with payment approach. And you can see there very clearly uh, how the, 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 the level of the payment increased with the uh, quality habitat. And I think the free uh, take home measures that I have from this landscape is, again, we implementing a model uh, that is all around the communities and engage with the community uh, and collaborate with them to, to, to restore our pillars. Again, all is about improving the habitat quality. So it's a new approach. So we're not looking at changing policies on the way that are reducing stocks or management. We're actually looking at improve the habitat quality and that usually links with everything else. And again, uh, it's a significant impact already in place. So again, we are applying this across all the whole country at the moment uh, with very successful results. And actually we're working together with um, the different departments across the government to implement restoration uh, and projects. Great, thanks very much, Fontaineth. Thank um, you. And finally, we have Francesca uh, Tannenberger from the Greisfeld Meyer Center, who's going to talk to us about investment and polluting culture. Over to you, Francesca. Yeah, thank you very much, um, Rolf. Um, indeed, we move a bit on more to polluting culture, to um, agriculture on peatlands now, on wet peatlands, of course, and also to the temperate region in Europe. Um, so, next slide, please. So it is very much about this hen and egg problem, as you may call it, and as you certainly know it. So I'm presenting the Tomorrow Initiative, which is an initiative of um, German partners so far. Um, that is Umweltstiftung Michael Otto in Hamburg and uh, the Soko Stiftung, uh, Soko Foundation and the Kreisert Meyer Center. We are working together um, for two years now, and um, uh, this is a long-term initiative. Uh, and here we really try to focus on the challenge to build new value chains. So to give you a bit background uh, for Germany, the German government allocated more than 1 billion euro for peatland revetting in this legislative period. This is very new. It's an action program for natural climate protection. Um, and uh, what we are seeing is a lot of funding opportunity now actually to revet and a lot of uncertainty with farmers uh, specifically uh, about the future of their land and how, you could, how they may continue farming. And in order to create the willingness actually and the incentives among biomass suppliers, farmers, landowners to revet their land, uh, it is very clear reliable and attractive sales markets must be available. So we are addressing the, the other businesses outside agriculture in order to generate a willingness on the part of consumers to convert production lines and processing chains, uh, sufficient raw materials of consistent quality and suitable offers must be available. So this is then the hand and egg problem. They, there is an interest and readiness also in other business, as you also may know from all your contacts, but then the reliability of the um, supply is the challenge as well. And uh, in this initiative, we are now mainly addressing, and these are the icons on the lower side of the slide, uh, packaging materials, actually um, building materials, and also furniture, for example, from paludiculture plants. And um, so a lot of biomass also from fen peatlands, actually. And then second slide, please. So in the first stage, we did a study which has been published last year, um, and the main outcome then uh, is presented here on the slide. Um, it's about the valorization of paludiculture biomass through um, value chains, material chains that can mobilize significant land potential. So we have 1 million hectares of drain peatlands in Germany that are currently under agriculture use and that are um, uh, prone to revetting in the coming decades to achieve our climate targets. 
we conservatively assume that in these value chains and in the total amount of raw materials um, to, currently um, used in Germany, in the German industry, a share of 5% of paludiculture biomass would be included. Um, and this would equal, given the um, biomass growth uh, productivity on the rebetted land um, and the amount of, of industrial use, uh, an area of 300,000 hectares with, that we can actually, um, um, uh, from which we can actually use the biomass. This would equal 30% of the area potential of rebetted agriculturally used peatlands. Again, for building materials, for packaging materials, and then in addition, of course, we have sphagnum as a substrate, for example, we have wet pastures with water buffaloes, energy production, and also areas for solar energy and wind energy production to actually make up the entire 100% of the peatlands to be revetted in future. And what is now the last part here, uh, we on the one hand side now have the Tomorrow Initiative. They We are forming an alliance of paludiculture pioneer enterprises at the moment. 15 large German companies have um, agreed and signed to be part of the alliance, and they are all starting their own paludiculture pilot product in this year. Actually, yesterday we had the workshop and they presented um, uh, the product they are now focusing on. And then we also have governmental funded uh, large scale projects. Um, they are running now over 10 years. They started mainly last year, some uh, 2020, 2020 as well. And they are revetting um, several thousand of hectares in Germany now with governmental funding uh, in these projects. And they are centrally coordinated also to make the most of the scientific knowledge that we can actually generate in terms of greenhouse gas emissions, um, in terms of biodiversity on these sites. And we are bringing now together these large scale products, uh, projects and um, the interests um, and the work of the companies to actually make the business case um, for paludiculture on various types of peatlands in Germany. And we are very eager and also open for exchanging with other countries in Europe, of course, to share um, all of our experience. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Francisca. Um, so now we're going to move on to our roundtable discussion. Um, you're going to be led by Emily Hickson, um, Director of Business and Investors at Climate Catalyst. Um, and just briefly to introduce our panelists, we've Shane McGuinness, um, Coordinator of Waterlands and also leader of um, uh, Peatlands Finance Ireland. Uh, Stephen Hart uh, from the European Investment Bank, Diana Kopanski from the Global Peatlands Initiative uh, at UNEP, um, and Sam Lambert from uh, Murova. So over to you, Emily. Um, Brilliant. Thank you, Ralph. And um, thank you to our previous speakers who really have provided tangible examples there how revenue can be raised uh, from restoring and rewetting peatlands. So that's a great place to start with our panel. Um, so we've got a, a great range of experts here, and I'm going to start actually by asking a, a question to Diana, who represents the Global Peatlands Initiative. Uh, and Diana, you might want to say just a little word about what that is. And then I really want to ask you uh, a kind of broad question to start with. Where are we globally, the state of investment into peatlands restoration and protection? Thanks so much for the question. And thanks also, uh, I wanted to really express the appreciation to this group, uh, as well as many of those that are sort of behind the scenes. Um, we're really been uh, trying to connect um, this finance work, the investment work with the Global Peatlands Initiative partners. They're raising this uh, to another level. Um, it's super critical if we're gonna have any hope to make our global climate and nature goals. And so the Global Peatlands Initiative is an initiative that was started at the end of 2016. And it's funded by the International Climate Initiative of the German government. And since uh, 2016, we started with 13 partners directly supporting four tropical peatland countries of the Republic of Congo, DR Congo, uh, Indonesia and Peru. And since then we've grown to 55 organizations from around the world diverse and many of them on on the session and the pieces of the puzzle are coming together not only have we done a successful advocacy but we are also seeing the topical areas that the global peatlands initiative has outlined as the four priority areas for action and advancement and one of them is on investment and finance so i wanted to go back to your question which is it is about this where are we globally on the state of the investment in peatlands we are at a dismal state um before 
the, the colleagues have showed some of the more innovative and, and emerging work. But honestly, we need to scale up at, at a great uh, speed and, and also with great accuracy, the investment in peatlands. We need it for restoration action, but we also need it for protection for these alternatives, which are polluted culture and other forms of sustainable management. And it's super urgent. Um, we need more and diverse investment investors at the table. We need them to work at the landscape scale. And for peatlands, this also includes looking at the uniqueness of the ecosystem at the hydrological unit as a peatlands hydrological unit. So we really need to make sure that um, the borders and the boundaries and the connected up ecosystems are also considered in the investment packages. Um, we know them as a super nature-based solution uh, because of course the emissions reduction opportunity is there, but we also need to keep them healthy. So the investment needs to look at not just emissions re reduction or carbon capture, but we need to look at conservation uh, and protection of, of healthy peatlands everywhere. Without this, we won't have any hope of making the Paris Agreement to degree. Um, so the Global Peatlands Initiative has also been working hard to improve on and consolidate the science on peatlands. Um, and, the and this is critical for the investment puzzle uh, because if we don't have the science or the understanding of the ecosystem or even know where these ecosystems are, uh, we can't have any hope of actually unlocking the level investment needed. Um, so at the end of um, 2022, uh, the Global Peatlands Initiative um, launched the Global Peatlands Assessment, and it has an accompanying summary for policymakers. And that summary for policymakers and the assessment actually also includes um, recommendations and ideas, uh, noting that in addition to the regulatory approaches, economics plays such a critical role to prevent further degradation, uh, you know, transforming the perverse incentives into appropriate incentives, uh, looking at public, at, at this blend of public and private finance, but also looking at, of course, payments for ecosystem services. Um, we've identified in that publication, a number of uh, financial and market instruments. Um, we also need to think about what is the design and the blend of public funding um, for peatlands? There has been already huge investment in the science um, needed to actually uphold investments, but we also need to think about taking these public funds to do risk and leverage finance to also ensure an access and fair, uh, fair access and a fair price and to the benefits to local communities. Um, there's much more I can say, but I want to highlight one more thing, which is um, that the Global Peatlands Assessment results, the science that has been um, consolidated there, it has been the basis for an upgraded UN, UNEP report, which is called the State of Finance for Nature. That was presented at the Climate COP, but also at the World Economic Forum and the Biodiversity COP previously. This calls for a triple of investments in nature-based solutions. The report also calls, sorry, there's some construction going on, um, for restoration specifically for peatlands. And we're looking at an average of 20, at 12 billion US dollars per year to get us below the two degrees. So um, the abatement potential though, these are tiny but mighty ecosystems, it's completely disproportionate. So we can't look at an investment or compare the investment or the opportunity of investment to a standing tree. It's much broader than that. Um, maybe I'll stop there. Um, the numbers are huge. I will share them in some of these in the, in the chat. So um, we don't go through the time. But also just to let you know that the Global Peatlands uh, website has all of these assets ready and willing for you. Thanks. Brilliant, Diana. Thank you for that overview. And I, I know there's always much more you can say, but I think, um, you know, you gave us a good a good overview there. Um, but we have to kind of dig into what you said at the start, whereas we're at kind of at a dismal state here, given given the scale of the challenge, given this is 5% of emissions, and also we need to conserve, as you said, and there's a bit of a disconnect here between the amount of capital that we're seeing coming in. So I'm glad that we have kind of two people here representing 
different forms of capital. And maybe we can dig into a little bit about what Diana was saying around, yeah, that need of blended finance. Um, so Sam, I'm going to come to you and I'd like to, love you to introduce yourself at the top of your comments, but I'm going to ask you kind of looking again broadly, what's your view on the track record of peatlands as a kind of asset class as Rappel uh, referred to it earlier and what needs to be done to kind of get investors uh, to be attracted to uh, investing in peatlands? Uh, hi everybody, how are you? Um, my name is Sam Lappert. I am an investment director um, with Morova. It is a pleasure to be here um, and speaking to you. Um, for people who don't know, Morova is an asset manager that focuses on deploying capital in support of ecological transition with a goal of maintaining the planet within a 1.5 degree boundary. I, I personally work within Morova's natural capital practice which looks at the ways that we can make investments that support local communities, that support local ecosystems, um, and really around how do you preserve biodiversity and address the climate crisis. Within that, we do investments around quite a bit around what we call environmental assets, um, which is a broad category, including um, nature credits, biodiversity credits, and carbon credits coming out of the voluntary carbon market. Um, but so to kind of go back into so my perspective on this is very much as an asset manager that is looking at a variety of different projects and looking at them around kind of which projects are going to be able to generate um, returns that are able to repay the investments. And I think that's a really important kind of context for any kind of comments around kind of how do you catalyze private investment, which is that there's an important difference between value and revenue. I think there's been a lot of work and it's very clear that peatlands have enormous amount of value um, around ecosystem services, around flood reductions, around kind of the importance they play for the climate and for our planet. But we haven't yet found really compelling business models that translate that value into revenue that allow investors to be repaid. And I think that it's kind of a fundamental challenge that we see across a number of different natural capital projects and especially more pronounced and nascent ones such as peatlands. Um, around peatlands, what we're excited about is very much looking at carbon. I think everybody has mentioned the importance of peatlands as a carbon sink. Um, and so there's huge potential there for peatlands to generate carbon credits. However, there's also a lot of uncertainty around what are the kind of prices that those carbon credits would be able to do. Um, obviously, there's been a lot of controversy within the voluntary carbon markets recently around how do you ensure that these are projects that have high integrity and that are making meaningful and real contributions to the climate. Um, that has, it has kind of made people question even more. Um, so then maybe just kind of concretely answer Emily's question of kind of what needs to happen um, for there to be more um, financing. I think first and foremost, there needs to be track record. It's incredibly difficult for investors to look at these projects and kind of say, what do we expect the return to be? Um, and particularly the return that can be accrued to the project, not the total accrue in terms of the value of the project that is serves the kind of the community and ultimately the world. I think the second piece around that is more specificity around pricing um, and particularly around kind of what do you expect, you know, what are the costs associated with restoring peatlands? Um, they're quite high. Um, and then what are the kind of prices that you'd be able to get for carbon credits that are issued from it? And then finally, I think, and this is a place where many people on the call can be incredibly helpful, is clear guidance around what is responsible communication practices around kind of peatland restoration and kind of environmental impact. Um, within the carbon space, there's an enormous amount of controversy around how do you make claims? Um, how do you make claims in a way that shows that you are being consistent with a mitigation hierarchy? I think there's no desire for us to come kind of into a structure where you have companies are destroying peatlands with one hand and then restoring, trying to restore them with the other and claiming that everything is okay. How do you do this in a way that is kind of appropriate and kind of so that companies can know what are the rules of the road and what are the right ways to communicate around it? Um, and I think that overall would be quite helpful. Thank you, Sam. Yeah, that's really clear. That kind of, we need one track record, prove that this works, prove that we can reduce emissions through 
through wetting restoration, that specificity around pricing, of course, is going to be really important for these projects and that that clear guidance uh, uh, and integrity, really. Thank you for, for, for giving us that. I'm going to go to Shane next as a kind of it's a, a real expert in this area, a developer of projects. And I just really want to ask you, Shane, kind of listening to that and, and, and with your experience, kind of what are the key challenges that you're having when it comes to accessing finance and, and generally in this space? What do you think is the key challenge? Thanks very much, Emily. Um, and thanks to the organisers. I've uh, been embarrassed to be called an expert in anything, really, but I'll take it for the moment. Um, a couple of key points that I, that I thought about over the last couple of days. Um, one is the support for the development of track record in this. And we all talked about pipeline and demonstrators or case study sites. And it's back to the chicken and egg as well that Francisca talked about, that we we need a bit of courage um, um, and maybe a bit of humility as well in, in acknowledging the fact that these things take time and that the timescales for returns in particular could be long um, and therefore the commitment is long. Um, and that's quite different to, to some other asset classes that might be much higher return and much quicker return. So there is long-term funding required for this, whether it be in support and development or in actual um, investable return. And as a result, there's understandable hesitancy around being this first mover. Um, and, and maybe we need to try and transcend that gap and, and blur the, the lines of insecurity or uncertainty. Um, but there's also hesitancy from the wider community. Um, because there is very easy misconceptions painted onto some of this investment, um, greenwashing or, or, or offsetting. Um, and, and that's not helpful. Some, sometimes it's accurate, but, but oftentimes it's not. And increasingly it's not with science-based targets, with community-based programs. Um, so we do need greater clarity in how we communicate that. Um, peatlands tell a very compelling story. Uh, they combine environmental, sociocultural, economic impacts all in largely speaking, a singular um, and high integrity and high security output. Uh, so they do tell a very, very strong story to, to most involved. What we, I suppose, do need to acknowledge is that there is still that uncertainty from a scientific perspective, but also from the structuring financially. Um, so that's the final uh, issue that I, I think I, I continually see with this, is th this disparity in what we deem as certain. Uh, scientists look for two years in a postdoc to achieve a single figure or a graph. Uh, investors might be looking for something in the next six months for their board meeting. So we do need to maybe hold hands, bring people together and continue those conversations and translate between the two dictionaries. Um, I'll keep it short and sweet and stop there. Brilliant. And I, I really hear a call to action there. One on kind of investors like this stuff is hard. It is going to be long term returns, but the value is really clear. So we do need kind of some courage, some leadership, um, some first movers. Um, we've got a great community to partner with here. And then also maybe a call to action to our kind of community, to the kind of conservation, uh, the green community to really grapple with some of the the, the nuance of around this, that we, we need this. And that, 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 as you say, with science based targets and with community projects, um, we really, you know, are way beyond the allegation of greenwashing. So we just need to make sure that, yeah, we've got a com common story. Um, I'm going to come to Stephen, uh, our, our last speaker, and we've got about mm, eight minutes left of this this discussion. And so, Stephen, I know, uh, well, you can introduce yourself, actually, at the beginning of your comments. But I'm interested in kind of what's motivated you to get into this space around peatland investment. Uh, and then what potential you see uh, and opportunities you see. Yeah. So first of all, um, I'm Stephen Hart. I come from the European Investment Bank, uh, which is the European Union's long-term financing institution. So that's, that's the spiel essentially to say that we are a mission-driven public bank. So we're, we're kind of uh, on a different part of the spectrum, say to, to private equity. Um, nevertheless, we, we, have the same reflexes, you might say, as, as a financer, we still need to get our money back at some, at some level. So what, what really motivates us in, in, in this space? Um, we've heard this, the numbers before, which put peatlands really at the center of natural carbon storage. So EIB has trans kind of moved over into to being classified as the, the uh, 
EU climate bank. So cl climate lending is, is really a core objective now for EIB and, and we have targets, um, very linked to the Green Deal at European level. Um, and effectively it makes peatlands unavoidable. So I would mirror some of the sentiments earlier. We're not exactly sure on the exact path always how to get there, but we do know that we need to get there. Europe has very significant peatlands, uh, many, many, many countries. Um, a lot of it is under, under agriculture. Um, in addition to the, say the, the, the carbon sequestration issue, there is the adaptation issue, which is really racing ahead now and coming to the forefront. And you can feel it in the air, really, that a continent like, like Europe is on the brink of some kind of a, a land use reform. There are simply so many problems across the sectors of agriculture, for example. Um, you also notice this, I mean, uh, many countries are now really talking about openly about abandoning large tracts of land really to address flood risk, uh, droughts. It's a difficult process, but the, the pressure is so high and the needs are, are so significant and peatlands are really very much at, at the center of that, that discussion. Um, in the short term, we're experiencing that, as I mentioned, partly in agriculture, um, where yields, droughts, subs subsidence really is putting enormous pressure on farmers to do something, to change, to, to really reconsider their business models. So these are, you might say, opportunities, really, you know, to rethink um, how, how we manage these lands. Um, so what we also experience is that it's, it's actually very difficult to completely abandon land. So very often it's more realistic to expect countries to want to adopt alternative uses. And that's the interesting space, you know, how to develop uses which are, you know, you know preserve the peatlands, um, but don't, don't go against the grain of, of, of the reflex of local communities really, you know, to whom they, they ultimately belong. Um, so the, the immediate area that we see right now is, is for example, under just transition. And it's also mirrored in, in European policies where, um, you know, previous uh, abstraction of, of peat for fuel, which is in, in, in Ireland, Finland, Latvia, a number of other countries, really is opening up huge questions about well, what then, you know, what to do with these, these lands, right? So the, the, these are some of the opportunities. Um, at a practical level, you know, we're, we're learning. Our original impulse to go into peatlands was really the co-benefits. It wasn't simply a carbon story. In fact, that perhaps was the, the, the last of it because our original foray into this area was really in the area of biodiversity. Uh, and it was clear that, that peatland investments, you know, get, gives one of the biggest bangs for the buck. Uh, in terms of uh, establishing, say, um, new new uh, feeding grounds, breeding grounds for for migration of birds or whatever, I mean, there are many areas in which peatlands are just uh, an incredibly effective way of turning something which has not much productive use into something, or degraded land into something which has a huge biodiversity impact. But on a more daily basis, what we try to do is within the framework of existing investing uh, investment strategies or programs. We have a, a proactive engagement really to explore, um, well, partly uh, MBS, nature based solutions, but specifically also um, literally setting aside, or you know, if our promoters in a way have some influence or control over land, say peatlands, you know, what can be done. And it implies that, that at least in the short term, much of the funding for this restoration will come through some kind of a synergy or cross subsidy with other strategies. But that's fair game. I mean, that in the absence, you might say, of a, of a regulated model for ecosystem services, you know, we, we try to find the opportunities where we can find them within um, say existing or larger strategies with, with corporates, with public sector, wherever, um, to try to convince them, really. Uh, most most uh, entities have some desire, you know, either for community relations, 
either as part of the long-term strategy, you know, to preserve catchments, for example. Um, and, and these are ripe candidates, really, you know, to, for engagement and to see if we can push them to go a bit further and, and a bit wiser. So right now we're focusing on, on supporting frameworks. Um, it, this is a complex area in terms of measurement, impact, community, all these levels really have to work together yeah. to create these, these economic and financial synergies. And it's, 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 hard, it's, it's great to see that the level of engagement really, you know, and thinking going into this. Um, and, and we're quite confident that it will mature. Thanks, Steve. And um, I'm sure the audience are going to have some questions there because you raised some big themes. But I think, you know, if you're touching on this, the change here is going to be inevitable. In fact, you know, it's part of perhaps the, the, the bigger land use reform thinking that we're going to need to do in Europe. And that then leads us into thinking about this, this peatland problem is more than, of course, yeah, just carbon, or indeed the investment opportunity is more than just carbon. It's also the social kind of change that will happen, of course, biodiversity as well. And so thinking of, at that level also, you know, hopefully can provide, you know, some, uh, some creative thinking around the investment opportunity. So I'm just going to come back to our four speakers and I'm just going to ask them one quick fire question in the last minute and a half that we have. And that is speaking to our investor community audience on the call, where are you, where in the, in the publication that we've launched today, do you think they should go and have a look? What part of uh, the report that we've just published uh, would you say is the most useful part? So I'll come to you first, Diana. I, I always like the call to action. <laughs> you know, what can I do? What should we do? What are what's in front of us here? So I would say the call to action is critical. And and I would also say that we need to look at this indeed as an opportunity for transformation. We're seeing um, as well at the global policy dialogues, um, this want for transformation. And that is this food, water, G, water, energy nexus and nature nexus that actually peatlands can be a great example for. So um, if we need a spot to, to experiment, let's prioritize those peatlands. Thanks very much. Great. Um, Sam, coming to you next. So obviously the call of action is important. I think as kind of Shane pointed out, you know, we're still trying to build out this kind of work. Um, and what is the way that there can be a track record and kind of how do you structure that given some kind of investment constraints? I think ultimately, I think I would be also kind of highlight for policymakers on the call to think through the investment risk reduction through public sector support section. Um, that ultimately that um, for a whole host of reasons, there will not be a wave of private investment coming in, private investment can play a role, but it will be far less than what's needed. And so I think there really is an important way of thinking through different risk reduction strategies, different blended finance techniques that will help encourage more, more finance coming from the private sector. Brilliant, yeah, absolutely. Shane. Yeah, thanks. And I would also second Sam's point there around um, uh, demonstrating clear costs of compliance as well. This is a huge element of this for And um, Moreover, looking at the, the report itself, I would focus on the, the case studies and um, the boxes that are peppered throughout the report because they demonstrate how this can and already is happening, um, which is often the real missing piece of this puzzle for either communities or investors, that it is a very well, otherwise quite nebulous concept um, that, that is difficult to explain, but it can be done. And I think these boxes or case studies do that very well. So yeah, I'd take a look at those if you have time. Agreed. As well as the case studies that have been presented on the call today, you know, including what Francisca is saying about polluter culture, um, different, different business cases will work in different places. And Stephen, I'll give you the last word to you. Um, I think first of all, the, the biggest value of the report is the completeness of it. Um, I think that that's one of the, 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 the great things. I wouldn't even say just pick one part, but it's just, it gives such a great overview of all the necessary components to make it work. Um, I think the two other elements I think are, are one are really, when, once you put your mission hat on, which all these people in the report have done, you find opportunities. You really find them. Uh, and, and in many ways, it's, it's the thing that shouldn't be able to fly but the report does a proof that it can. And I think that that's, that's the interesting thing. You know, this is, in theory, it's not bankable, investable, whatever. And yet, 
people are willing to pay for it. Yeah, I think we've got to hold on to that. Um, thank you, panel. That was uh, great. And I'm going to hand back over to Rolf. Right. Thank you very much, Emily. Um, that, was a, that was a super panel. And thanks very much to, to all our speakers. Um, so I'm going to take us through now the, sort of the question and answer session. Um, I think we've got about 10 minutes for that. Yeah, 12. Um, so thank you very much, people, for your questions. Thanks very much to our panelists and uh, presenters who have responded to some of those already. So I'd encourage people to have a look at those responses. Um, so I'm going to focus on the questions that haven't been answered already and focusing on maybe more of the general ones first that kind of are more global um, rather than those that are more specific to a, a certain locality. So the first one, we've got two questions around insurance. Um, and Rupal, I was going to call out to you to maybe have a, uh, give an answer to those. So specifically, what's the role of insurance and more specifically, what's the role of insurance against non-delivery of carbon credit, biodiversity, ecosystem services. So has this been considered to enable finance? Thanks, Rolf. Um, on insurers, I think there is a real investment opportunity here because when we look at peatlands and through the report we outline, uh, investing in peatlands it reduces wildfire risk, it reduces flooding, which in turn basically impacts the insurer's bottom line. And therefore it is really, really important that this is part of the overall adaptation agenda. When we look at COP28, COP29, and the fact that we're moving, especially with COP29, it will be a massive focus between nature and adaptation, um, that insurers do get involved and um, it does affect the insurer's overall profitability and therefore shareholder value. I'll let my colleagues on the rest of the call uh, add to that if anyone's got anything else, but that's at a very high level. Thanks, Rupal. Anyone else got something to, to add? Going, going, gone. Okay. Um, so moving on to the next question. Um, there's been quite a few around tropical peatlands in, in different aspects. And I think a lot of our focus here has been on European peatlands, um, but there is a tropical side. So Diana, I'd, I'd just like to kind of maybe package a couple of questions together for you, if that's okay. Um, but really, um, in terms of tropical um, peatlands, you know, what kind of assessments are out there um, and what in incentives are there to invest in tropical peatlands? Are they the same as what we've been discussing or are there nuances and difference with, um, uh, with tropical peatlands? Thank you, Rolf, for the question. And um, tropical peatlands, of course, are, are very different. And in many of the tropical peatlands, they're forested. So they're often confused with actual forest action. A lot of the work um, under the UN RED program and, and the RED uh, results-based payment mechanism for Indonesia has actually been through the restoration or the rewetting of their tropical peatlands. So it's really um, complex because they've been treated as, as a forest. So we do have some amazing examples from, from Indonesia, especially on how to look at the opportunities. They have created a green bond. They've created some, um, some uh, regulatory mechanisms as well, but it's really still challenging because what's missing, especially in the tropics is the fair price, the sustainable fair price. We're not seeing a true uh, fair value price that can be accessed as well by the communities that are living in and around um, those places where um, peatlands restoration is happening. Um, so I would say there's great um, information. Also, we did a, a publication called The Economics of Peatlands. There's cases in there from the tropical peatlands perspective. So have a look in that piece. I'll put the link onto the to the site here. Right, thanks. That's a very, very compre comprehensive answer. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Shane, a quick one for you, because I know this is something you've been looking at in Ireland, um, the opportunities beyond carbon. Um, what are those for, for peatlands? Absolutely enormous. And I think really uh, carbon is just one of the feedbacks of some of the other uh, services. Uh, I mean, if you think about peatlands, they only function in the way we want them to when they're wet. So water is the first thing that they deliver, really. If you reestablish the hydrology of these areas, then it leads to biodiversity reestablishment. Obviously, the carbon then um, reverts to what it should be doing. And then the, the, the amenity is reestablished as well. Uh, so water is a really, really important um, and almost immediate feedback, really. And we can quantify that and we can package that into something that is valuable. Um, 
In terms of biodiversity, Stephen and others referred to the, the costs of compliance that government departments and others spend every year trying to meet these obligations, whether it's European or international. Um, and in Ireland in particular or elsewhere, uh, we are struggling to meet those, those commitments. Um, so it can be framed in that way also in terms of the biodiversity feedback, but also the community, um, socio-cultural um, and even historical or, or spiritual values of these areas are almost never recognized. Um, and it is part of the story. It is part of the package, I guess. Uh, what we won't do, what we certainly shouldn't do anyway, is look at those services individually um, because the, the combination of those as a bundle of ecosystem services is much greater than the sum of their parts. So that's the way we should be looking at this. Right, thanks, Shane. Um, so skipping kind of beyond restoration, um, um, Paul from the lab, this is, a, I think, a question that you, you might be interested in. Basically, the drivers, we've, we've talked a lot about restoration and the benefits of restoration, but are we also addressing or how do we address the big um, drivers of peatland degradation, drainage, um, investment into maybe some of those activities that are happening? Uh, is that something, Paul, can, you'd like to speak to? Yeah, certainly, certainly, Rolf. Um, <clears throat> I think in the tropics, uh, many of the peatlands are on um, have forest on them as well. So it's been forestry that's been that's been uh, uh, draining them and uh, <clears throat> and changing them. In in the temperate world, it's um, it's it's agriculture. Uh, agriculture is starting to realise the value of of peatlands, and I think I think forestry is in the tropics as well, uh, especially when you can get uh payment payment for protecting protecting peatlands um the big challenge is to get some, get to some scale we've seen we've seen a consistent approach to rainforest protection that's paying for for um investments down to community level across very large areas in places like the congo tanzania in borneo and so on we're starting to see the potential for that in Scotland, Ireland, in, in Germany, Netherlands. Can we make a, a consistent approach to this so that so that payment multiple payments for carbon benefits, for water benefits, for biodiversity benefits can go to landowners um, so that they can they can benefit from protecting peatlands rather than destroying them. I think that's the challenge that we have ahead. But um, and slowly we're seeing that that's possible. How to now now systematize that is the is uh, is our work ahead. But this report helps us to to think think that that's possible at least. Right. Thank, thanks, Paul. Uh, I'm now going to break my my own rules and actually go to a couple of questions that have been answered already in the chat. But I find the questions intriguing. Um, so one of them um, is, where are the global sweet spots for peatland investment? Um, Sam or maybe other other panelists would like to uh, have a go at that one. Um, but I think it is interesting. Sam, would you, would you like to speak? Yeah, I'm happy to talk. So I think, I think it's incredibly tricky. Um, and I think we think about it from three different, um, three different factors kind of come into it. Um, so one is simply the cost of doing it. And I think Right now in Europe, a lot of the land that you see, there's kind of very, very high opportunity costs um, of kind of what else could be used for the land um, and what else that could be um, done around. Um, and then also implementation costs and operational costs are quite high. Um, and so I think there's a kind of real appeal for Europe if when you can find parcels of land where there is relatively low opportunity cost for whatever reason um, to make it viable. Um, and that's kind of a pretty kind of think place around it. I think when you're talking about um, other countries in the in the in kind of the global south, and, you know, particularly in DRC, um, you are kind of very quickly entering into a conversation around political risk. Um, and here again is an area where there is an opportunity for different insurance schemes that can help um, secure around it. Um, and then when you're looking at a country like Indonesia. Um, where there's still political risk, but it's much less and kind of international investors can be more comfortable with it. Um, what you're then looking at is kind of the regulation of the market and clarity around kind of that the um, assets that are generated through the investments will actually be able to be returned to the investors 
um, and not ultimately considered part of a national NDC contribution or something like that. Um, and so the, I kind of overall, you're kind of trying to find the sweet spot uh, between those three kind of different considerations around kind of the underlying costs around it, um, the um, political risk associated and the macroeconomic risk associated with it, and then the kind of overall regulatory environment around it. Um, that's from a kind of global geographic perspective. There's also very much a, the reality of it is that very few organizations have the kind of intersection of credible kind of ecological restoration experience and also credible kind of financial and investment experience. And so some of it is also a little bit opportunistic of this is an organization that is able to bring together these two very, very different sets of skills that allows a kind of invest project finance type opportunity to go forward on the field. Right, Thank, thanks Sam, that very comprehensive answer. Um, so I think I'll, I'll close the, the Q&A there. Um, thanks very much for the questions. Um, many of them were intriguing. And I think the ones we haven't answered, we will get back to people um, in the report um, on, on the, of, the, of the call. We will, we will answer those questions. Um, so now I'm going to hand over to Shane to do a wrap up for us um, or make sort of closing remarks. Um, and also we're going to have a, a survey. Over to Great. You, Shane. Thanks very much, Ralph. Um, first of all, just to, to briefly uh, well, attempt to, to give a landscape view of all of this. Um, scalability and blended impact is really key here. Um, peatlands offer climate, socio-cultural, economic and biodiversity impacts. And like I said before, they can be packaged into a singular bundle that is greater than the sum of their parts. Um, peatlands also offer high integrity and security in that investment. Now it is long term, they do tell a very compelling story, which I think in other landscapes isn't always true, certainly not in terms of the security and integrity. Um, as Stephen pointed out and others have as well, um, the, the purpose of this doesn't always need to be returns based. There is a willingness to pay element that is very important to listen to, whether it be internal reporting that you are investing in, whether it be costs of compliance from a state or semi-state entity. Um, so in terms of a call to action from this, uh, I would, I guess, seek your willingness to be part of the development um, for the right reason. I think there are lots of other reasons to be involved in this, um, and I, I think there are very clear right reasons to be involved with this, um, and I think there are enough uh, actors on this call to be part of that solution. Um, as part of that, I call on you to familiarise yourself with the sector, with the terminology in particular, um, read the report and reach out for clarification on that, and build those bridges and build those bonds, and also have the courage to be brave with this. Um, it is not a, a small endeavour, it is also not a quick endeavour, um, but it is an extremely valuable one. Um, so do lean into this process because it, it needs that from your side too. Um, and then finally, think about peatlands and their stakeholders, um, because all of that uh, is long haul. And we are in it for the long haul in terms of scientists or, or project developers. And I think, uh, well, state actors are certainly, they've got long-term commitments. Um, so the financial community should be as well. Um, whether that be on an advisory capacity, whether it be on an actual funding capacity. Um, so consider how you could be part of this uh, as well. This is not simply a communication of a report. This is the beginning, well, certainly the, the middle of some of these processes. So it is not, uh, there's no full stop at the end of my notes here, I suppose. I'll stop. I'll keep it quite quite short and sweet um, and pass back to, to Ralph Rodicia. Thank you. Also, sorry, before I pass back, um, a massive thank you to the organizers of this uh, this event itself, um, Disha, Ralph, Sabrina, um, everybody else involved in the lab um, more broadly, and then also the, the authors of this report um, and the wider contributors to it as well, who have made it a very, very strong uh, product, which I hope will not simply sit on a desktop. Do read it. Thank you. Brilliant. Th thanks very much, Shane. A very nice note to end on. Um, yes, big thanks to everybody for joining, all our speakers and contributors. Um, please, everybody, read the report, share it, get in touch with us. Um, we're very keen to engage um, and looking forward to hearing from you. Um, so with that, um, I'll close um, and final thank you for, for joining us today. Cheerio. Bye-bye.